of the things that are, are relatively new uh, for parents to deal with are the internet and video games. Mm -hmm. are, are video games necessarily bad? And no, not necessarily. It depends what it is. If it's, uh, keep in mind, a TV, even though it's a passive or interactive influence in terms of affecting a person's mind, and we know it does. If it wasn't, then Coca-Cola wouldn't spend as much as it does on advertising in every, every other company because uh, it influences a person's behavior. But video games are a different matter. Now you're actually physically interacting. And whether it's with your thumbs or a trigger on a gun or something else, or it's a steering wheel as you're racing down the road, those activities that are involved with uh, graphic images of, of mayhem and, and murder and, and harming people uh, can affect kids. Now, that doesn't mean that every child that plays a murderous video game is going to go out and commit a crime. What, uh, a couple things happen. It does uh, increase likelihood of aggressiveness. And certainly many of the children who have been found to be the ones involved with high school shootings or school shootings are, are many times kids who are involved with, with overly involved with those games. Um, but it also can lead people to believe that there's more crime out there than there is or that there is, uh, it's okay to handle things in an aggressive manner. Companies market these things to kids because they know they'll buy them, they'll play them. And a lot of times kids say, oh, don't worry, Mom, it doesn't have an impact upon me. What I suggest parents do is this. Uh, I would suggest that they not necessarily buy these things in the first place. If they have some things, or whatever the level of aggressive game is, but some kids, even with a simple little um, Game Boy, can get so involved in this and so tense up. It's important for parents to say, you've got to take a break from that. You know, get away from it. Some kids develop a this addictive behavior to these things where they've got to play it all the time, every day. Um, uh, that's the purpose of some of those games. It's important for parents to pull the plug and say, it's going off for a while. Now, the other thing is the Internet, mm -hmm. and everything you read says parents should watch what their kids mm -hmm look at on the internet and monitor what their, their activities on the internet. And how do you do that without sitting there and looking over their shoulder and kind of snooping on them all the time? So what if you snoop? And so what if you look over your shoulder? The point is, is you, you have a stranger in your house teaching things to your child that you wouldn't necessarily let. I mean, think about this. If, if, if there was a knock on your door, someone you did not know at all came in and said, you mind if I spend an hour with your child every day telling him whatever I want? You say, get out of here. I'm going to call the police. Well, we do the same thing with the internet. And kids are pretty adept at quickly changing the screen. I found it interesting. There's a commercial on TV. I, I'm not sure what it was for, some computer company that shows, in a joking way, these two girls talking through their computer to each other. And mother comes in the room and says, no, you're not on the phone. You know, you're grounded from the phone. And it was supposed to be very clever. Well, what kind of a message is that that the media is sending? Once again, it's one of those multiple messages that we send kids. It's okay to trick your parents and be disrespectful. You would not have seen a commercial on TV like that some years ago. But it's that issue of the attitude that it's okay to be nasty like that and, and, and trick. Well, all those are parts of things I think parents should watch. You can put blocks on computers, on things like AOL. You can adjust what level, mature teen or child or uh, adult levels. It, uh, you can have other kind of uh, filtering mechanisms which work. You have to update those now and then. Uh, and if kids keep circumventing those and they're getting into areas that uh, you don't want them to get to, you turn off the computer. Uh, I, I know some parents that had to essentially, the child could only be on it when the parent logs in the password and the parent is sitting next to them because they'll get into very violent things, loading down images of, of how to make bombs, uh, pornography, many other things. You just got to watch it. I'll get back to your, your list that we had talked about, about a, a temper or, or an explosion and mm -hmm. how, it, uh, how it builds up and what to do. And uh, the first step we talked about was the build up, which mm -hmm. you said can take weeks or months, and then the spark. The spark. And what, what exactly is the spark? The spark is some event that occurs, and that could be a thought, or it could be an actually something that did occur, that will set the child off. It could be a, um, something that somebody said, they stubbed their toe, uh, they got a bad grade, whatever that might be, is the, it, it sets off an argument. Now, under those circumstances, where I said in the, in the build-up stage, the parent's job is to prevent, in the spark stage, the parent's job is to defuse. Somehow come up with a quick answer to say, we've got to calm this down. I'll move on to explosion stage. That's next. And the explosion stage, that's what we usually pay attention to. That's the one that has all the screaming, yelling, fighting, kicking, whatever else goes on. Here, the parent's goal is to contain the anger, not to negotiate, not to say, okay, if you calm down now, I'll give you whatever you wanted, but to really try and say, you need to calm down. We will talk about this later. Go to your room and relax, or I'm so upset, I'm going for a walk and I will come back. We have to work this out. And the fourth stage of the build-up spark of the explosion is the aftermath. Very important, but probably the one that is ignored the most by parents. It's in the aftermath stage, after things have calmed down from the big argument, that a lot of parents, especially parents of angry children, are so happy it's over. They say, don't bring it up again. Let's leave well enough alone. Let's not talk about it in, 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 because we're afraid he'll fight again. But that's the time if parents say to him, 
you know, we told you you couldn't go, and then you had this big argument, and now we're going to punish you even more because you're mad. Yes, you're going to have more problems. People say, all right, we, you know, we told you that uh, uh, it, when, you, when you get mad or upset, you can't punch your sister. You need to be disciplined for that. We want you to know that. But I still want to talk about what was that bothered you and see if we can come up with some solution. Kids may still get ornery or uh, difficult, but they may also find that this was the time you promised them they would have, and it's important before when you said, calm down and we'll talk about this later. You have to make sure the later comes or else kids won't trust you anymore. And that later comes and you do review it and say, let's think about what happened. What was it you were trying to do? Okay, you're trying to work out TV time. All right, well then let's set up times you can choose or your brother can choose. Or you're frustrated because the homework has gone bad. Let's find a way to help you. We'll get you a tutor for gosh sakes. It's a lot easier to get you a tutor than it is to have you beaten up your brother every day when something goes bad. It's the aftermath stage when the parent's goal is to solve the problem. And that's what we've got to pay attention to. Are there times when you meet with parents and they're, they're going through all these problems and you, you say what you say to them and that they just think you're expecting them to be superhuman? I mean, parents have flaws too. Sure and we do. Some of them are similar to the ones their kids have. Mm -hmm. So how do parents kind of rise above their own failings in order to be this superhuman parent? Well, I think realization that we're human is an important part of humility that is an essential part of being a parent. Uh, there are no super parents. Uh, kids don't come with a manual. I always say they don't come with a manual, but, but at least when it comes to dealing with anger, I want, want this to be a manual that they can, they can look at uh, reading, reading the book. Um, I might also say that there, I also have a website for the book, too. It's www.theangrychild.com, which other tips will appear in there now and then in response to parents, because I hope the parents do recognize they don't have the answers, uh, and they're going to make mistakes. And in the book, I talk about parents making mistakes, but that's okay. You rise from it. What's important if a parent makes a mistake in that aftermath stage to come back and say, I did a dumb thing. I should not have done that. I said some things that were mean, and I really apologize for that. doesn't let you off the hook for what you did, but I'm really sorry I should not have done that. Or, you know, I grounded you for the rest of your life or for the year. That's, I'm not going to do that. That's not appropriate. But you will be grounded for what you did for a week or something that's more reasonable. It's important that parents understand they make mistakes, but by so doing, I think kids can have a lot more appreciation for the difficulties of parenthood and, 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 and understanding and more affection thereby as well. Because they say, yeah, my parents are honest enough to say they made a mistake. That's a great role model, I think. But the parents still need to understand, just because they made a mistake doesn't mean the parents should say, I made a mistake, therefore I won't punish you at all. Say, no, you're still to be held responsible for what you did, and I'll be responsible. I knew a family once where they were upset with the kid swearing. And in the midst of all this, the father was so mad at this kid for swearing so much, he let out several expletives himself. And, the, and the, there was a set discipline for what the child did. And said, Dad, you've got to pay a fine, too. But I don't think it's fair that you have to pay a quarter for each one of those words, because a quarter means nothing to you. But to me, it's a fourth of my allowance. For, uh, so the right types of things there, too. And it actually be an interesting lesson for the both of them. It turned out that way. And because, uh, you know, another parent would have said, by golly, you're not going to correct me. But it was a good way of each one talking together and engaging in a process of changing. And I think that's helpful. What do you think about discipline? And what works? And can you talk about it a little bit through the different ages? I mean, what works for a three-year-old? What works for a ten-year-old? What works for an 18 We have a few hours for that one. Are we? <clears throat> um, the discipline is issue uh, changes with ages and stages. Uh, for example, with a three-year-old, you cannot spend as much time talking in the same way as you would with, a, with an older child. Uh, I think it's important for young children to respond at the moment when you can. And they can do a timeout, uh, you know, sitting in a chair in a corner or something for a few minutes. Uh, you can't do that with a 12-year-old. Uh, but for some older children, what you can do as time goes on, you can remove privileges from them. <clears throat> Take away a dessert, you go to bed earlier, um, you, can, uh, you, you may get grounded for a day, you may miss some TV programs, you may have time away from the computer, you may work towards rewards. Um, for some uh, kids of young school age and, and preschool, what you can also do is say every time you do this thing, you, know, you get a sticker, and when you earn enough stickers, you can turn them in, cash them in for something. I don't think that's bribing, I think that's, you know, you're paying, you know, helping a child become aware of a way to change in a positive direction that you want. What I tell parents to do is sort of divide life between what they want to see more of, what they want to see less of, and what they want to see stay the same. What they want to see more of, they should reward and praise. What they want to see stay the same, reward and praise. What they want to see less of, that's what you discipline uh, through some of the, the negative things or also a reward more of the positive when they, when they do the opposite. So, but over time, um, make those adjustments in terms of or whatever kind of things the child likes of that day or like that time if you're going to pull back and discipline. One of the things that I think is very important for angry children <clears throat> is I don't think it's appropriate or nor helpful to use physical punishment with them. These are kids who already may lash out and hit or threaten to hit, and I don't think it helps at all with those children. 
for parents to respond by hitting them. What do you do if they're hitting? <clears throat> well, that's where I talked about during the, during the explosion stage. Your goal is to contain it. And if they're, if they're, um, <clears throat> excuse me, if they're attacking each other, that means you separate them. You go to your room, you go to your room. So don't calm down. Um, sometimes, in some circumstances, parents are going to have to restrain their child, hold them still. You've got to relax. You've got to let go. Leave me alone. I'm going to get him. You've got to take some brief, deep breaths. You've got to relax. Junior, get out of the room. I'm going to get him. You, know, you, you just have to do that. If a child's threatening the parent, I don't think it's a good idea for the parent to stand there nose to nose with the child and scream back at them and, and threaten them. Uh, I think it, it's at those times for the parents best to back off and say, let's calm down. If parents feel like they're at their end of their rope and they've tried everything and it, this, this angry child is ruining their life, what do you suggest for them? Where do they get help? Well, I certainly suggest that the book was written for those families, and I hope that they will read The Angry Child and, um, <clears throat> as I said, the website also, theangrychild.com. But I think that's also um, call a psychologist, psychiatrist, uh, or some other therapist experienced in working with children. If they are not aware of someone, call the child's pediatrician or family doctor. They probably have someone they can recommend uh, for them. Uh, Make sure they look at all the other avenues there to see if there's any other uh, diagnosable uh, emotional concern that is there. I mentioned before things like attention disorder or other things too. But, but get some help. Don't be afraid to get help because there's people out there who really can help families turn around. There's a lot of hope for kids like this. There really is. But so oftentimes families are so intimidated, they're giving up. And I want them to know that if they don't give up and if they work with some changes, they can see a lot of success. How could you tell when something, uh, like we talked about siblings fighting, is, is just normal sibling rivalry and let them, let them fight it out and let them settle it, and when it's a, a real problem that the parents have to step in? Well, uh, sibling rivalry does happen a lot. Um, jealousy, one, the younger one wants to be able to do what the older one is, and they fight back and forth. A couple quick things that parents can do. I talk about the role of the, the judge. Parents, if the kids are old enough to do this, says, all right, I'm going to be the judge. I want to hear each of you tell me what happened. And after you tell me what happened, you'll each get a chance to respond to what the other one said, then I'm going to pass judgment. And I'm going to tell you what to do. Another role is the referee. The parent doesn't have to ask about it, think about it. They saw what happened. Baby, uh, Barbara's sitting on the couch. Danny walks by, smacks her on the head. Just like a referee, foul penalty, go to your room. I don't need to discuss this. That's just wrong. You crossed the line. Um, another role is sort of the, uh, the hands-off approach. They're not going to do anything. They're going to ignore this. And, I, and parents can do that if they know their kids can work it out. If the kids are going to say, well, I want to watch this, or I want to do this, or you come play with me, and you just hear them, they're just working it out. Even if it's building up a little tension, a parent can stand back. But if the kids are really getting down and dirty fighting, I don't think the parents should just have a hands-off approach. And, and the fourth approach is the teacher. And you can do this with older school-age kids and say, you guys fight all the time. I'm going to give you an assignment to do. I want you to write down what the problem is and what you're going to do about it. And then I want you to show me that paper, and I'm going to grade it. And if it is acceptable solution, I'll let you try it. If it simply comes back and says, I'm right, she's wrong, that's not acceptable. I'll grade that. And we'll keep working on this paper until it gets done. And that's sort of a form of timeout. They have to go somewhere and sit and do something and be out of fun. But then they also have to uh, come up with a solution on their own. So there's lots of things parents can do with sibling rivalry to help out. What kind of reaction have you gotten to the book so far? A good reaction. I mean, I, the things I see on some of the websites like Amazon and um, Barnes & Noble, some nice reviews that parents have written. Uh, it's pretty flattering reviews from some reviews as well. What um, uh, also is showing up is um, parents who read it and say, you, you've seen the window into my world of my child. Uh, and because it's so practical, it's written in parentese, not psychobabble. A good reaction from folks. I like that. This is the cover of the book we've been talking about, The Angry Child, Regaining Control When Your Child is Out of Control. Senator Tim Murphy, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, callers and viewers, we are ready for the uh, call-in portion of this program. And this is something we have not done, a call-in program following a live book program. But the phones are open now. And for the next hour, you'll be able to ask questions to Senator Murphy. The phone number, as always, is toll-free, 1-888-730-1310. And uh, uh, we are paying for it. So if you get a ringing sign, sound, just hold on, let it keep on ringing, and we'll be getting to the calls in just a couple of minutes. Um, Senator Murphy, one thing we did not get to in the first hour of this discussion is uh, Ritalin. Mm -hmm. You mentioned it in your book. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? A good thing when it's used right. Uh, that's uh, very important how to handle this because what has happened with Ritalin is, it, is it, I think the concern is it gets overused. Children who have a diagnosable disorder of attention deficit disorder, Ritalin as a stimulant medication has been found to be very effective in helping in many of the cases for the children. It is a stimulant medication which we believe stimulates those portions of the brain, oftentimes in the forebrain, that deal with uh, control of impulsiveness and attention, sort of like our executive or our coach or a controlling part of the brain. 
seem to stimulate those portions that otherwise are not as active. And so the child uh, gets out of control and impulsive. But uh, the concern is, is that in many cases, people are actually referring children to get drugs just to control them. Uh, parents, school personnel say, uh, kids out of control, we want to get them back in control, give them some drugs. And then it's